the, the thing... I mean, this is a segue, but it, it makes sense. The thing that I think psychedelics do that addresses this problem and many, many problems or um, choke points in our ideological effort to understand what's going on is the contribution that they make is that they dissolve boundaries. And culture... I mean, the ver- word virtual reality was used as we went around the circle. Culture is the sanctioned virtual reality. And it is put in place by the machinery of local language, you see. And so then you're born into this circumstance and you're told, you know, you are a male child, you are a citizen, you are a citizen of the United States, you are a Christian, you are a Jew, you will go to college, you will do this. And you, this you never question. It's called the social contract. It hasn't gone unnoticed by Western philosophers. It's just, it's gone unnoticed by those of us who are its foremost victims. They try to tell you that you're in a social contract But when you ask to see your signature on the document, they tell you that you were born into this contract. Well, what the hell kind of contract is that? (laughs) It means that you were born into a kind of enslavement to a linguistically empowered paradigm of virtual reality within which you will walk around your entire life uh, you know, congratulating yourself on its accomplishments and uh, ignoring its uh, contradictions and weaknesses. So what psychedelics do and why they are in all times and all places such social dynamite is they dissolve the cultural machinery. Doesn't matter. You know, head-shrinking Amazon native... Hasidic Jew, Chinese merchant of, in Singapore, whoever it is, the psychedelic dissolves their cultural construct and puts them in touch with the fact of being in organism. And being in organism is like what you get when you take off your real clothing. Not this clothing, but the clothing of language, programming, and assumption then you find yourself within the context of organism outside the context of culture. And for the reason this is not a mass movement is many people hear that and they say, I know what that is. That's called being nuts. (laughs) I don't want that. That sounds absolutely terrifying. Well, these are people for whom that cultural machinery is necessary armoring in an almost Reichian sense. Necessary armoring. They cannot face the world without culture because they are in fact defined by culture. Now, who are these people? These are the people, and we each to some degree imbibe in in this category. These are the people whose values are set by the uh, engines of commerce and propaganda. These are the people who dress as they are told to dress, spend as they are told to spend, believe as they are told to believe. But within every human being, there is a kind of, at least the possibility, of a revulsion against this kind of... uh, anesthesia of uniqueness because that's what it is you can put your uniqueness to sleep and then you know you dress Gucci and you invest with these people and you drive this car and you know you're correct because your accountants your managers your agents your public whoever your husband your lover is telling you that you're correct definition from without means being defined by the cultural machinery. Uh, Cultures other than our own have somehow always known 
perhaps because nature is such a huge force in, outside the Western industrial democracies, people have always known that this was a fiction, that the world of cultural values is um, a necessary illusion, if you will. And so they create a class of people called shamans, or seers, or magicians, or trance ecstatics, or what have you. And these people are deputized by the cultural machinery to go beyond it. To go beyond it and to return with truth. Not culturally sanctioned truth, but just truth, the felt experience of being an organism that I'm talking about. And by this process, uh, cultures conduct their evolution, if you're an evolutionary thinker, or their random walk through time, if you're more of a phenomenologist. But whatever they're doing, we're not doing that. Because the mechanisms that we have used to close off access to the beyond culture dimension have in our hands grown so strong that we have in a sense succeeded to the point where we've put ourselves out of business. And the people to blame for this are these wily Greeks. Because... While everybody else was carving horned masks and painting themselves with cross-hatching and stuff like that, the Greeks got the idea, we'll do it differently. We will portray the surface of the naked human body in marble. What this means is that the eye rises to the surface of reality and looks around for the first time from the point of view that we would call naive realism. But what a cultural journey it took to reach naive realism because you had to sever yourself endlessly from the intuition of a symbolic, magical, spirit-haunted universe. And the Greeks, through a series of cultural accidents, and I would say mistakes, ultimately, achieved this. And they had then an alphabet, a phonetic alphabet, which empowered a further severing of linguistic intentionality from the essence of the object intended. Because you see, a phonetic alphabet symbolizes sound. It doesn't symbolize the way something looks or its thinghood. It just symbolizes sound. And uh, the phonetic alphabet then issued into a series of cultural styles, science, rationalism, mathematical analysis of phenomenon. I mean, this was something absolutely unheard of and, and is the unique contribution of the Western mind that, you know, people noticed that you could take a gut string and shorten it by half and the tone would shift one octave and stuff like that and they got the idea of numerical analysis which opened up the path into culture to the present world. Well, each of these steps into Realism, and remember I said we would call it naive realism. Now that word takes on a different meaning from the context of the 20th century. It was naive. It was horribly naive. In fact, we were led down the primrose path by such simplistic notions because what was suppressed was uh, the invisible, messy world of the spirit and the human unconscious. This is the great tension that illuminates Greek civilization. You know, on one... I mean, it's all... Take Plato as an example because here in one thinker, 
these uh, uh, distinct strains of thought, these uh, antithetical strains of thought are perfectly present. You have, you know, an overarching realism, a drive to categorize and to arrange in rational relationships, and you have a thoroughgoing mysticism with roots back into the Minoan religion of Crete and back into Egypt and Africa. I mean, it's really extraordinary. And that was the last moment in the Western cultural enterprise when these things were in balance. And they were not in balance in any one particular person. If you lived in that world, you probably had to pick and choose. And, you know, the, uh, the skeptics were sneering at the Gnostics who were saying secret knowledge came from an unspeakable place beyond the machinery of cosmic fate. And the skeptics just thought, you know, baloney, what kind of talk is that? Now, we live in the consequences of this naive realism because like all forms of innocence, if allowed to grow beyond the proper bounds, it becomes festering, it becomes decadent, it becomes not innocence but idiocy. It turns on itself. And this is, I think, the kind of world that we're living in. Now, parallel to this, a cultural adventure of several thousand years, the rainforest peoples of the warm tropics of the world kept intact the high Paleolithic style of cultural relativism mitigated by natural magic. And what did natural magic mean? It meant these dissolve, boundary-dissolving experiences with hallucinogens. Now, it isn't simply, I don't want to make it sound reductionist, it isn't simply that culture builds up structure and psychedelics dissolve structure and then conduct you into some shimmering existential realm of... of uh, transcultural being. It isn't that. It's that in that shimmering transcultural realm of being you discover new modalities, new rules. There's something there when you dissolve all the boundaries that you can. And the paradox of what is there from the point of view of the legacy of rationalism is what is there is an immense love and affection and intentionality waiting to engulf suffering mankind or the individual. This is the, what I call the mind behind nature, what people call Gaia, the uh, mind of the planet, the uh, organized intellecti that somehow is the mothering force that encloses the whole of planetary life. This is a, a real thing. And I would never have thought so had I not had experiences which forced me to consider this. I think without the experiences, that rap comes off as horribly namby-pamby. You know, I mean, it's just, oh my God, not another one of these Gaia people, you know. But, in fact, this is a fact of reality, which anyone who, who has the courage to make the proper investigations can satisfy themselves is a real uh, object of experience. The, you see, I, I guess, I mean, I grew, I'm 45, I grew up through the 50s, and I can remember these movies where the white people get captured by the cannibals and, and put in the pot to be boiled, and there was always a witch doctor, right? Well, this guy just epitomized the most nightmarish forces of unbridled primitivism and ignorance imaginable. Now, this has become 
or is in the act of becoming, I hope, the guiding paradigm of the culture. Because what the shaman is, is the person who is still, and it's men and women, the person who is still in touch with this organic intelligence that lies behind nature.